want to start the interview with asking you about your personal experience with skin cancer because you've had a number of them and I'd like you to walk walk us through what each one of those has meant to you or in aggregate what they mean to you. Yes, in fact, I'm not even sure I could tell you how many I've had. Um, many, you know, in the more than 10, probably less than 100, but, but somewhere in there, yeah. Um, when I first started having skin cancers, I was a little um, upset and very concerned. And then I got used to it because I had so many of them. And then um, I had a melanoma. And that re, uh, kind of reopened my eyes to the fact that, that this isn't a joke. It isn't, it isn't something that's just a daily activity. Um, getting checked, it's it's a serious situation. And um, until I had the melanoma, I was I didn't take it very seriously. I continued to um, oh, I spent a lot of time out time, but I continued to be out there without sunscreens as often as I may mean, I put them on, but I didn't reapply and didn't do the things that you're supposed to do. Um, and then when when I had the melanoma, um, it scared me, and I decided that I would take it seriously. But it's a little late because um, I've done a lot of damage to my skin. And so it's, um, it's one of those things where I'm not, um, I'm used to it. I'm in here regularly. And I always have something that has to be removed every time I'm in here. And um, probably will have to the rest of my life. Um, but, it's, but I take it seriously now. You said an interesting word earlier that you were upset when you were first diagnosed with skin cancer. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain how that manifested in you and what the underlying reasons were for being upset? Well, I think when you're young that you think that nothing is ever going to touch you, that you're kind of invincible, untouchable. And so, um, the activities that I became involved in, not paying attention to um, the sun and, and the tanning beds and the, and the other things, I didn't really ever expect it to manifest into skin cancer. I just assumed that I would always be okay. So when I then did get skin cancer the first time, um, again, it was an eye-opener. It was, it was frightening, and um, it made me realize that that I wasn't untouchable, that I wasn't invincible. And that's, I think that's just part of growing up. I mean, when you're young, you just don't think things are going to, it's, it always happens to somebody else, but not to you. Right. So. And you have a unique history with sun exposure and yeah. tanning beds. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, I owned a tanning salon, and I also had a bed, a personal bed at home. So I was in the tanning bed, um, you know, probably almost every day for a couple of years. Um, back then, they, they told us that tanning was actually not damaging to the skin. And that it was, for especially for somebody with, with fair skin like I have, that it was probably better to get a base tan. And then when you did go outside, you, you wouldn't burn. Well, of course, now we know that that's not true. And so I did a lot of damage to my skin. I was in a tanning bed all, probably every day for years. Can you bring us back to when you were in a tanning bed? What, what emotional need did it fill? What mm -hmm. physical, psychological, what, what needs did it, how did it feel good? Well, a tanning bed does feel good. It's warm, it's comfortable. I would often fall asleep. Um, Thankfully, they had timers on them that would turn them <laughs> off. But uh, it's uh, it, not only the comfort of the tanning bed itself, because it was very comfortable, um, but just because I am so fair, I always wanted to have a little bit of color to my skin. And, and I didn't tan well, even when I did tan, but um, just having a little bit of color and not being constantly white was a, you know, was a, it was something that I wanted, and, and so 
that part of it as well. Did you feel healthier having a tan? I did. And I think people do look healthier when they have a tan. Now I know that that's not true, so when I see people with dark tans, I actually worry for them a little bit. But I do think people look healthier. I think skin looks um, better when it's got some color. Yeah, I married an Italian. Uh -huh. <laughs> she's got that beautiful, she's a beautiful woman, but she's got that beautiful olive skin. Right. And I, like you, don't belong a second in the sun or, right. or I burn. Um, and before I got into medical school, I was told that tanning beds would help my acne, and I had big cystic acne. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I don't scar very easily, um, but I had about a year of being in tanning beds before. Regularly. Regularly, right, yeah. Because I remember when a lot, of our, a lot of the people that would come to our tanning salon came for that reason, that purpose, yeah. and also for depression. You yeah. know, they told, they told people that they would help with depression. So we had a lot of people that came in to try and, and I think it did help. Right. But yeah, and it was interesting at for what me cost? Because when I, when I was going for acne, it, it felt like I was doing something good for my skin. Mm -hmm. It was so warm and so comfortable. Right. And it's like being lulled to sleep. I mean, it's just lovely. It is. Um, and then you look a little bit more tan, and, and tan can be associated with more vibrant, especially when you're very pale. Right, with health. Yep. And then I got into medical school. You found a out that wasn't later, the truth. <laughs> and I felt I felt a little duped, uh, and I felt that I should have known better. Well, I'm actually pretty surprised that we still have tanning beds around, and there are no restrictions, as far as I know. A lot of states now are banning teenagers. Are they? Oh, from, that's good. Which is great because the younger you are, the more damage you're actually doing. The older you get, you're still doing damage, but not nearly as much. I mean, none of us would even think about putting our babies in a tanning bed to get a healthy bronze, right? We all, if someone came into your tanning <laughs> bed saying, hey, we have a two week old, we want to give them a healthy tan, you'd say, you're crazy, right? But, um, but we do it to ourselves and our kids. And I think that within the next couple of years, every state will ban tanning for teenagers. Good. You know, the World Health Organization classified tanning beds as cancer causing as cigarettes. Really? And, yeah. And we don't allow teens to buy tobacco or, you know, younger than 18. And I think that that is going to be the same for tanning beds. Hmm. Can you walk me through? When, when you started to realize when tanning beds weren't actually good for you, because most things in life, we, it's not like a, the light clicks on, literally, or off, literally, with knowledge. It's, it's kind of like this creeping, I know in my personal life, it's this creeping feeling like something isn't right, something, and then something tips you over the edge. Mm -hmm. So can you walk me through that journey, if that's accurate, for what you experienced? It's so long ago, I'm not sure I can really remember, but I am suspecting that it was the first time I had a skin cancer that, that really shocked me into believing and understanding that this was not the right thing to do. And I think you're right, when I was spending a lot of time in the tanning beds, there was a part of me that said, you probably shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be spending so much time. But it was comfortable, it was relaxing, I felt better about the way I looked. Um, so I continued to do it. But I think that first skin cancer was um, the light bulb, so to speak. But I don't totally remember. And I, I, I do know that it took a period of time for me to really recognize that tanning was not good for you. And um, even though I quit doing it on a regular basis, and I, and I took, the, took the tanning bed, I sold the business, I took the tanning bed out of my um, home and actually kind of prayed that I wasn't going to get sued by anybody. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know I, I think now there's enough disclaimers out there that people can't claim ignorance. But certainly when you owned your tanning salon, the evidence had not mounted. No, um, we were telling people it was good for them. Yeah. We believed it. I mean, we weren't being dishonest. We well, were telling course. them the same thing that we were being told ourselves. Right. And so um, it was... 
it was unintentional. However, I'm a little surprised that nothing ever came up on it because I was in the business for a number of years. Sure. So. And you're a beautiful woman. Thank you. And I didn't know you when you were younger, but I would imagine you were a beautiful younger woman as well. <laughs> um, what would you tell women who are in their teens and their 20s who want that tan, who still have that unfortunate thought that beauty is external. All of those sort of things that as you grow older, you realize, wow, did I have it wrong? What, what would you say to yourself a number of years ago? I don't know that you'll ever change the mind of young people, teenagers, especially girls. Um, I think those that are even brought up in a family where they're taught that the beauty comes from within still deal with the outside world, still deal with um, others um, in their lives uh, who judge them according to the way that they look. And, um, but even beautiful young women in today's world, really beautiful young women, um, have low self-esteem and go and get all different kinds of things. I mean, they're, they're, I was just reading an article where girls as young as 10 and 12 are getting um, facelifts and injections and all of the things that, that, are being, um, that are available out there that they believe they need in order to stay beautiful. Right. So I don't know that, I, I'm not sure that anybody can say anything to them other than um, life is a learning experience and as you grow older and you and you walk through the experiences thankfully we generally not everybody but we generally learn that there's so much more to life than the outward 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 appearance appearances sorry the outward appearances and that um, truly the beautiful people that I know are not the ones necessarily that are beautiful on the outside, they're the ones that are beautiful on the inside. And I think most people do learn that, um, but I think it takes experience, life experiences to get there. What would you say to a parent who their child just came to them, 15, 16, and they're begging them to let them go to the tanning beds? I guess what I would say to them is to try to give them the information, the real information about how damaging it is. And um, again, young people believe that they're untouchable and that uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure that you could talk to them about skin cancer as much as you could talk to them about the damage that it does to your skin and how Ill it will affect you when you get older. The, the, um, the aging process and how quickly it ages you versus those who don't get out in the sun. Sure. I think that would speak more to a young person in today's world than talking to them about skin cancer. And what would you say to somebody in their 40s or 50s who've had a history of not necessarily just tanning bed use, but also a lot of worshiping of the sun? Um, I would suspect by then they'd already have had some issues. But if they haven't, I would definitely tell them they need to read the information. They need to make, they make, they need to make themselves clear on, on what the truth is and how damaging it is and start looking at what skin cancers do to people and, and you know, the pieces of the body that are, that are cut out on a regular basis. And um, you know, some people don't have horrible experiences with it because it's not on their face, but most people that have problems with skin cancer, it is their face and their neck and their shoulders and the, and the area that is out there all the time. And it's um, when all of a sudden you find out that the tip of your nose is going to be taken off. And um, thankfully, you did radiation on my nose, but I have certainly seen a lot of people that have had the tips of their nose taken off or the ends of their ears taken off or their lip uh, um, removed um, or the side of their face. Yeah. Um, so 
I would tell them that they need to spend some time recognizing the realities of it, of what really happens, and before they make a decision whether they want to continue to do that. There's going to be some providers watching this, some physician assistants, some nurse practitioners, some estheticians, some doctors, some dermatologists. What would you tell us? What, what is the message that we need to hear from you of what we're not doing right, of what we can do better for you? Um, if you could talk to all of us in a room and say, listen, guys, do this, do this better. What, what, what advice would you have for us? Well, I've been to, in the years that I've been having problems with skin cancer, I've probably been to six or seven different dermatologists. I've been here for quite a while. Um, and the main reason that I moved from one place to another was that I didn't feel like I was being taken seriously. I got a, you know, they would just do a quick look at me. And I think also the older that you get, especially women, I think that men are a little uncomfortable um, looking at an older woman's body, you know, and, 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 and you know, I, that, that was, that's the way I felt sure. yeah. at different places that I went to, that they weren't taking it seriously. And so if that's the case, I think that they should do like you do and have women who are there to do, um, I can tell you that when I get my, when I come in every three months and, and I get looked at, it's with a fine tooth comb. And I know that I've been looked at. Where in the past, what's happened is that it's just been really quick, really fast, and I, and I, and I felt like I was walking out there without really knowing whether or not I had something serious going on. And that was even after my um, melanoma, knowing that I'd had a melanoma. I really wasn't taken very seriously. So I looked until I found the right place, and I found the right place. And I think it's something that we all struggle with no matter what profession you're in, when you do something day in and day out. Sure. Um, you know, I know for me, probably my hardest thing is, well, right before we had this interview, I, I was communicating with, with a gentleman who I removed a good part of his lip yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it's such a balance between being objective enough to do a good job surgically or exam-wise or fill in the blank. A good enough job as a doctor. But at the same time, not making them a disease. Right. Right? You, you, you have to objectify so you can do your job, but then you have to switch to have the compassion part of you that tries to reach out, tries to empathize, and tries to be somebody who we would want taking care of our loved ones. Right. And I, I've been a, a doctor for a while now, since 2002, and it's still a hard balance. But I think I can definitely listen to what you're saying um, and have it be a reminder to, to this is not uh, just another exam. This is a person. This is a, someone who has hopes and dreams and fears and concerns and all those things. So I can do better yeah. too. Well, I think taking somebody seriously is important. I, I think the other part of it too is um, being able to be honest with a person and, and let them know you're making choices in your life here. And this is, this is a serious choice that you're making. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I, and actually until you, you were, when I first met you, you were very, very straightforward with me. And I wasn't quite sure how I felt about that. <laughs> but, I, but now I'm glad. Um, but somebody needs to be. You know, people need to know that when they walk out the door, if they're not taking it seriously, um, they run the risk of not only just um, seriously having damage to their body, but the possibility of death. I mean, there are many cancers that are very deadly, and I know actually have a friend right now who is, is dying of melanoma. Um, I have two friends actually who are dying of melanoma. One's ocular and one is one was a, um, 
on the skin and then it, then it, it came back a couple years later. It's deadly. And so, not just melanoma, I know that all but basal are deadly, or can be if you don't take it seriously. So, I think the doctors, um, yes, I think you have to have empathy for what a person goes through and recognize that um, that it is, you know, that we live our lives the way that we live our lives. But I think you have to be straightforward and honest too in telling somebody, especially somebody that's not paying attention to it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.